Climbers who go to the Himalayas, and especially to Everest, know the risks they take. For this, the highest mountain in the world is still one of the most dangerous. The British expedition, led by Chris Bonington in the early summer of 1982, was to prove especially tragic. Like Mallory and Irvin half a century earlier, two of Britain's finest high-altitude climbers, Pete Boardman and Joe Tasker, disappeared high up on the Tibetan side of the peak. No one will ever know exactly how they died, but this simple memorial left behind by their friends will stand in their memory until the ravages of ice, wind and snow finally erase it. The mountain has been climbed many times, but it continues to exact a heavy toll indeed. Those who come from distant lands to pit their skill and courage against these icy bastions, one in ten never return. A few weeks later, the team was back in England, and two of the surviving high-altitude climbers, Chris Bonington and Dick Renshaw, met at the London house of Charlie Clark, the expedition doctor. Boy, the Himalayas certainly, I mean, are very, very dangerous. One's just got to look at the, the number of people who get killed in the Himalayas. And this is, I suppose, because of the number, the scale and the size of the objective dangers. In the Alps, the Serac walls are that much smaller, the crevasses are just that much fewer, the arrival of bad weather is that much less serious. Whereas in the Himalayas, it, it's somehow scaled up about tenfold. And yet I think in one's approach to the Himalaya as a mountaineer, perhaps one does put blinkers on and one, one must do. One, one ignores these objective dangers. One doesn't court risk and danger. One, one's going climbing in there, or I'm going climbing in the Himalayas, because I love the mountains. I love the challenge they present. I love the whole business of trying to climb a new route. And I therefore push this risk thing to one side and say, well, it's probably not going to happen to me. Once I'm on a trip, I don't think about the, the uh, possibility of death or the risk, risk of it. I just get carried away by the, the task in hand. I think you're right that you, you do put the blinkers on. And so, so did Pete and Joe very much. The cooperation of the Chinese government meant a return after more than 40 years to the north side of the mountain, the traditional approach of so many British expeditions in the 20s and 30s. But in contrast, this was to be one of the smallest expeditions ever mounted for an assault on Everest. Just four climbers, backed up by a doctor and a base camp manager. The plan was to attempt a hitherto unclimbed ridge without the use of oxygen. For the leader, Chris Bonington, this was to be his third journey to Everest, but his own first attempt on the summit. Pete Boardman was the one member of the team who had already achieved the climber's dream of standing at the world's highest point. Since then, he and Joe Tasker had established one of the most successful partnerships in British mountaineering, including the West Wall of Changabang in 1976. Dick Renshaw also had many climbs to his credit around the world, among them a winter ascent of the north wall of the Eiger. No less than seven previous Himalayan expeditions had given Charlie Clark as much experience of practicing medicine at high altitude as anyone else in Britain. The job of base camp manager went to Adrian Gordon, who'd been on the Southwest Face Expedition seven years earlier. 
Lhasa, the forbidden city, capital of Tibet, with the great Patala Palace towering above it. For many centuries it was thought to be the highest building in the world, the Everest of all man-made structures, and one of the most beautiful. Even today, the presence of Europeans is an unusual sight. For many years, the monastic dynasty of the Dalai Lamas imposed a policy of isolation for fear of seeing their culture eroded by Western ideas. And with the arrival of the Chinese in 1950, it seemed as if the door might be closed for many generations to come. But times change, attitudes mellow, and quite often, mountaineers find frontiers open to them which remain barred to traders, tourists, and politicians. But in those first hours, Charlie Clark had other things on his mind. When we were going up the steps of the Patala, what I was thinking is, my God, we're now at 13,000 feet or whatever thereabouts Lhasa is. And I felt so tired. I mean, I could barely put one foot in front of the other, and I thought, I'm going to have to go another, I don't know, eight, 9,000 feet higher. Was I going to manage it? With 400 feet of steps behind them, the team entered the courtyard of the palace itself. Until a few years ago, as much a mystery to the Tibetans themselves as it was to the outside world. Now it has become a place of pilgrimage for hundreds upon hundreds of patient worshippers. Everywhere, there was a smell of rancid butter, a gift for the Buddha, and the main source of fuel for the thousands of lamps which lit the interior. With their cameras and bright anoraks, they felt like intruders amongst these devoted people, who appeared to live in perfect harmony with their mountain landscape, without ever desiring to conquer the huge peaks surrounding them. In his diary, Pete Boardman described being moved almost to tears by the golds, the intricacy and the devotion. But now, it was Everest, not Lhasa, that began to occupy Chris Bonington's thoughts. This is the model of Everest in the Royal Geographical Society in London. Now Everest, of course, is on the frontiers of Tibet and Nepal. And the frontier actually goes up the west ridge of Everest to the summit and down the south ridge across the South Col and on up Lhotse, the second peak of Everest. Now, before the war, Nepal was completely closed to foreigners, but Tibet open at least to the British and so all the pre-war British expeditions came in from over here from the north though of course they didn't get to the top and then after the war the position was reversed Tibet of course was closed but Nepal opened up and it was in 1953 with John Hunt's British expedition that climbed up through the western coombe of Everest up the Lhotse face to the South Col and then of course it was Ed Hillary and Sherpa Ten Singh that made the final push to the summit and climbed Everest for the first time. Since then, the mountain's been climbed literally dozens of times from the Nepalese side. And we played our own part in this in 1975 when we made the first ascent of the southwest face of Everest. And then, just two years ago, the Chinese opened up Tibet and mountains in China as well. And of course, this year, it was to give us our great opportunity. Anyway, we'll go and have a look at the northern side and we'll be able to see better from this side over here.
You've now got the same view that that first British Everest expedition in 1921 had as they came round to the north side of Everest. And that expedition and all the subsequent attempts before the war came up the East Rongbuk Glacier, on up to the North Col, and then on up the North Buttress, up to a height of round about 28,000 feet. And that was as far as any of those pre-war attempts got. And then, of course, the mountain was finally climbed by the Chinese using this same route on up to the top of Everest. But for us, the challenge was the unclimbed east-northeast ridge of Everest. And this was the last great unclimbed ridge of the mountain. On up here and on up towards the top here with the difficulties, a sting in the tail right at the end at over 27,000 feet above sea level. To reach Everest overland from the Nepal side means nearly two weeks of walking across fierce torrents and mountainous ridges, passing through isolated villages which will probably never see a motor vehicle. The approach from the Tibetan plateau is altogether different. From Lhasa to Everest, the journey takes just three days. A good road built by the Chinese and sturdy trucks in very capable hands would take the expedition and all their supplies right up to base camp at 17,000 feet. As they reached a high pass on the road, suddenly there before them was the Everest Massif, which the Tibetans call Chomolungma, the goddess mother of the snows. This was the site for which British mountaineers had been waiting for nearly 50 years. There were still some rivers to cross, and a caterpillar tractor had been procured in advance by Mr. Chen, the Chinese liaison officer attached to the team. The river, Zaka Chu, which comes down from the great glaciers above, was already beginning to pour. As they approached the foot of the glacier, they were confronted by a tragic sight. The famous Rongbuk Monastery, a landmark and a haven for all those pre-war expeditions to the mountain, now stands in ruins. The base camp itself was another dismal sight. It was snowing, the temperature was in the minus twenties, and there was an icy wind gusting up to 40 knots. Worst of all, the campsite looked like a municipal rubbish dump. All around lay beer cans, batteries, gas cylinders and fragments of broken glass left behind by previous climbers and trekkers. And for the base camp manager, Adrian Gordon, there was another problem. Unfortunately, as far as the Tibetans were concerned, whatever they had been offered in return for their services wasn't enough. For shortly after we got to base camp, we found that they'd had light fingers and had been dipping their hands into some of the boxes and taking literally anything that they could get their hands on. When we confronted them, they didn't show any signs of guilt or remorse at all and in fact seemed to take it as rather of a joke. Well. This desolate place would be the nearest thing to comfort they would experience for the next two and a half months. Here they would have to return after each big push up the mountain to recuperate and recover their strength as best they could. Climbing Everest is always a matter of timing. It was now the 17th of March. They had arrived at base camp a month earlier than the British expedition of 1933. This meant they would be facing the last of the winter's cold and wind. But they should have more clear days of high altitude climbing before the onset of the monsoon. Fifteen miles to the south, the mountain watched and waited. <laughs> 
as one more besieging army pitched camp beneath its ramparts and prepared for the coming assault. We've got a complete bundle of string over there. Do you think that's enough? We should take... I think there should be another uh, complete roll of um, the... What do you call it? Polyprop. Yeah. <laughs> it's about all on the tent, isn't it? We've got all together 10 S200 stoves. Those little blue ones. The little blue ones. With the sun shining once more, base camp began to feel a little more like home, even if it still lacked hot and cold running water. This daily chore was cheerfully undertaken by Mr. Yu Bin, an interpreter supplied by the Chinese Mountaineering Association. He and the liaison officer, Mr. Chen Rong Chang, together with a cook and a driver, would be taking over the running of base camp once the team moved up the mountain, forwarding letters from home and keeping in touch with the outside world. On every expedition of any length, food becomes a major obsession. It was once described on a previous climb as the sole remnant of culture the metaphor within which all dissatisfaction is expressed. This time, the job had fallen to Charlie Clark. It's amazing with these rations that you never get it right, or you never seem to get it right, because if you remember, what we did on this trip was that everybody in 1981, while we were at Conga Base Camp, I took a list of all the things people liked and disliked, and I made up the rations, really, to please everybody. And it seems fine when you arrive, and then after a month or two, and particularly when you get over 6,000 metres or, or 20,000 feet, your appetite just wastes away, doesn't it? I think that it's partially as well. I think you develop a kind of a less and less of a tolerance to dehydrated foods. And that, certainly on the, the snow holes this time, we were, none of us could eat any of the freeze-dried food at all. And whereas, say, last year on Congo, we'd actually put chilli powders and garlic in it, this time we found that even that didn't work. And we ended up joining Dick. We all became vegetarians. And, I mean, and even taking the things that are, I still think are gorgeous. I mean, those lovely smoked hams and salamis and cheeses, uh, all of which we took up to 21,000. And, and they tasted pretty good there, to start with. Even those palled and... Uh, you just didn't, want to eat, just didn't want to eat anything, did you? In two days' time, they hoped to be setting out for advanced base camp at 21,000 feet. For Pete Boardman and the others who would be trying for the summit, this was a last chance to check over their equipment in comparative peace and comfort, the crampons and foot fangs to which they would be entrusting their lives in the days ahead. Knows what it's like to be a bad man, to be a sad man, behind blue eyes. After dumping the expedition, the lorries had gone. The next stage of the journey would be made with the help of yaks. Each day, the animals were expected, but they failed to arrive. It was already the end of March and time was slipping by but Tibet cannot be hurried. Despite the frustration, they were valuable days. The team took the opportunity to relax and acclimatize. Then suddenly, there they were. Four young yak herders, driving their animals up the Rongbuk Glacier, where none of them had ever set foot before. Yes, <laughs> 
negotiations were quickly completed. There seemed to be an affinity between these tough Tibetan mountain dwellers and the team. On both sides, there was an immediate liking and respect. They had now been at base camp for nearly a fortnight, and much would happen before they enjoyed its comforts again. For Joe Tasker, this would be the last chance for some weeks to send off a parcel of film. April the 1st, all fools day. Before them lay a 15-mile trek up the East Rongbuk Glacier to a site they had chosen for advance base camp, 4,000 feet above. <laughs> Everything now depended on the ability of the yak herders to coax and persuade their animals up into the wilderness of rock and ice that lay ahead. It soon became clear that the yaks thoroughly disliked any change in the surface and it needed a few well-aimed stones to keep them on the move. Not that the herders were cruel or indifferent. Throughout Asia, the team had never seen people who took such devoted care of their animals. If a yak went lame, one of the herders would immediately unfasten its load and shoulder the burden himself. Fantastic ice pinnacles guarded the approach to advance base camp. But when after three days they finally reached the place, it proved to be a bleak and bitter destination. In the weeks that followed, ferocious winds and sub-zero temperatures made it almost impossible to relax. And the climbers coming down off the mountain preferred to retreat right down the glacier to base camp itself in order to recover their strength. Now, for the first time, they had a clear view of their objective, the last great unclimbed ridge of Everest. In perfect visibility, Joe Tasker set up his camera and made a slow pan along its length, charting the route they would have to take. Instead of using tents on that exposed and windswept edge, the plan was to build three snow holes before tackling the pinnacles, which promised some of the most difficult climbing ever undertaken at such an altitude. Beyond lay the summit itself at over 29,000 feet, with its pennant of clouds streaming out towards the east. In one of the last recordings he was to make, Pete Boardman described the next phase of the climb. To begin with, we approached the foot of our route from the 21,500 foot col of the Rafu Lar. This col is two miles away from our campsite, a two miles walk across a great white featureless expanse of glacier. To guide our return, should the weather deteriorate, and to mark the way through the dangerous crevasse zones, we hammered small flags into the hard ice. From the Rafula, the large crevasse at the foot of the, of the route, uh, we climbed and then mounted up a thousand foot ice slope to the real crest of the ridge 
a crest composed of hundreds of tons of ice and snow suspended above the other eastern side of the mountain. Little by little, we are unlocking the secrets of this long, unexplored ridge. The snow was crisp and hard, perfect for crampons, and the weather seemed to be holding. For a time, they were able to savour the sheer exhilaration of climbing where no man had ever set foot before. is swept constantly by winds from Tibet to the north and west, and the only way our small team could find shelter was by digging a small snow cave at 22,600 feet in altitude. It took many long hours, laboriously chopping at the hard, sugary snow, until at last we'd made a hole that was big enough for all four of us to squeeze into. At one point, I was shoveling a bit too enthusiastically, and the shovel flew off its handle, and I very nearly decapitated Joe, who was filming me at the time. Once inside the snow cave, we could relax, forget about the wind outside, and eat and drink and recover in preparation for the next section of the ridge above us. Meanwhile, the yaks had returned to base camp to bring up a second load of supplies. Fortunately, for one of the animals, the doctor, Charlie Clark, went with them. One of the yaks had cut its hind leg on a stone sticking up from the ice, and it was bleeding profusely, and obviously the animal wouldn't be able to carry a load the next day. And Agnuru, the... Uh, Yak herder beckoned to me in my first aid kit and soon I had had the bandages out and I made a sort of makeshift horseshoe out of the lid of the marmalade and strapped it on. But of course Adrian and I didn't spend all our time acting as vets because our job was to keep the expedition supplied and we made the journey up to advanced camp three times. And it was long but it was never boring because we were really travelling through the most exhilarating country I'd ever seen. It was now the 12th of April. Already a week had passed since the team first arrived at advanced base camp. For the climbers on the ridge, steep snow slopes lay ahead, up to the point where they hoped to build the second cave, at just under 24,000 feet. That day, Dick Renshaw recorded his thoughts as he climbed. We left camp one about an hour ago. We're climbing on ropes up a 45 degree slope towards the site of our camp too. This is our third day. Climbing along these snow slopes. Unfortunately, the tracks have been covered by spindrift during the night. Uh, heavy breathing. This is a few more or orifices take, taking oxygen. The feet are just beginning to warm up. I've been able to feel them for the past hour. Uh, toes, that is. <laughs> 
By now, the weather had changed dramatically, and the climbers found themselves isolated from the world and each other as the mist swirled around them. The cold became intense, and each step forward was a step into the unknown. For a brief moment, Joe Tasker handed over the camera to Pete Borden, who filmed him coming up to the crest of the ridge. As soon as they began to dig out the second snow cave, they hit rock. It would have been exhausting labor at sea level, but here, at 24,000 feet, on a perilously exposed ridge of Everest, it was a Herculean task. For Joe Tasker, it was the filming as much as the mountain itself, which had now become a passion. In all weathers, he was building up a record of every stage of the climb. With true tragic irony, it was to become his own epitaph. For the next two days, they had to endure a violent storm. Vicious winds of up to 100 miles an hour ripped through advanced base camp clawing at the fabric of the tents. Movement of any kind became impossible. On the third day, the wind began to moderate, and the climbers began to push the route forward once more. They were now at 26,000 feet without oxygen. Every hour spent at such an altitude would mean mental and physical deterioration. But each time they came down from the ridge, they faced a long and laborious haul back up to their previous high point. With minds numb with cold, each man tried to husband his strength and assess the level of acceptable danger. This is the voice of Joe Tasker on the 22nd of April. It's about at least six inches of snow on top of the firm, crusty snow underneath. No, maybe we can just rump across here. Crampons biting into firm neve. Just got to watch your footing. Now you feel... If feet could give way beneath you any minute, I'll send you down about 2,000 feet to the bottom. Just gotta concentrate the whole time. The wild full of such morbid thoughts. Accents, left foot, accent, right foot, left foot, accent, right foot, left foot, accent, right foot, left foot. About three foot of snow between me and a vertical drop of about 4,000 foot. The final snow hole was hollowed out on the east side of the ridge with a view down the fearsome Kanshang face of Everest. The strain could now be seen all too clearly in their faces. After one more day of climbing, Chris Bonington decided they would have to go down. Yes, um, thanks. I, I have been able to see them. Uh, you're sitting on the ridge, are you? Over. I understand you're you're probably coming down tomorrow, having already been to over 8,000 meters. But otherwise, you're quite well. Is that right? Over. The ridge ahead 
narrowed into a knife-edged crest of snow. Beyond it, the way was barred by a series of rocky pinnacles stretching ahead for half a mile. With painful slowness, they moved towards them. This would be the crux of the entire climb. But within an hour, the weather had changed for the worse. Laying fixed ropes as they went, the four men moved steadily upwards, fully aware of what it would mean to be caught here in another violent storm. Dick Renshaw and Joe Tasker out in front, they were now at very nearly 27,000 feet, higher than all but a handful of the world's mountain summits. Then something happened to Dick Renshaw. I'd uh, just climbed a very hard pitch. It was about 26,700 feet when I felt a strange sensation down the left, left side in the body. It was a, the left arm went numb, and I got rather alarmed when the left side of my face and tongue lost all sensation. I told Joe about it, and we decided the best thing to do would be to go back down to the snow cave at Camp 3. But you didn't really think how, how serious it might be, did you? No, not at all, because it was over I mean, in about ten minutes. Because, I mean, the minute I heard about it, it, there was very little doubt in my mind that it was, you know, that it was really very, something very sinister. Mm. I mean, I think what happened to you was that, uh, that a small blood vessel in the brain did become blocked off, and this has been noted to happen on previous expeditions. Um, in fact, on the early expeditions, one of the, uh, the Gurkha officers who was with the team died of a stroke um, going up to advanced base camp and uh, and the things that make it happen at high altitude I think principally the fact that your blood's getting much thicker because of the lack of oxygen you're making more blood cells and this makes the blood stickier uh, and then it then it clogs up you you almost dismissed it at that stage presumably partially not to erase kind of alarms, and partially was it to give yourself time to think it out? Because I mean, you only told me the next day yes. just how worried you were. Yeah. Well, it was partly that, and partly that I'd left all the useful drugs behind at a base camp. <laughs> <laughs> In a state of near exhaustion, the four climbers came down from the ridge back towards advanced base camp, where Adrian Gordon and Charlie Clark were waiting for them. You came into view on flat ground it was. Couldn't have been easier. And, and you looked like old men. You were stumbling along with a broad gait and mm. creaking, moving so, so slowly. And of course, I think when you saw the camera, you all crispened up and began to walk a bit faster. All four were suffering from severe coughs caused by the altitude. And crisp Bonington, 12 years older than any of his colleagues, was beginning to doubt whether he had enough remaining strength to try for the summit. In the warmth of the mess tent, Charlie had rigged up some makeshift inhalers to relieve their throats. It's the only thing that softens it. Now, Pete, do you want some Irish stew? Yes, please, because that's the... It's Tibet, Tibetan frozen lamb. Oh? Huh? Yeah. It's that carcass you brought up. Walked up right, so. And you want some bread? 
This was possibly the highest loaf of homemade bread that has ever been baked. It's a bit gamey. Yeah, it's, it's an acquired taste. Adrian hates it. Adrian hates it. Adrian hates it. Adrian hates it. But he makes it only stew in the pressure cooker. I now realised that there was absolutely no way that I could keep up with Pete and Joe. In addition to that, I very much doubt if I could have even ever got back up to our previous high point. I was now so exhausted. And so I decided that I'd better drop back into a support role. The actual plan for what we hoped was going to be the summit bid was that Pete and Joe would move swiftly, firstly straight up to Snow Cave 2, then up to Snow Cave 3, and then go for the unclimbed part of the pinnacles, the crux of the climb, to join the north ridge and hopefully go on to the top of the mountain. Now, on coming back, reversing these pinnacles could have been desperately difficult. And therefore, Adrian Gordon and I were going to leave advanced base camp and go up to the north Col, wait there for them. And this would mean that Pete and Joe, either having finished the pinnacles, they could either drop down or having reached the summit, they'd have a safety retreat straight down the North Ridge, which is comparatively easy. Next day, Charlie Clark took Dick Renshaw down the mountain, intending to return as soon as possible. And Pete Boardman and Joe Tasker, the only members of the team any longer in a state to try for the summit, prepared to return once more to that desolate and windswept ridge. I think we were all building ourselves a little front. I don't think we could afford to admit that we were worried and afraid. Now, I know I was afraid quite a lot of the time, and I didn't admit it. And in the same way, when Pete and Joe actually went for the summit, I'll always remember both, well, the whole lead-up period, they were almost conning themselves that it was, it was going to be a pushover going over the pinnacles. And I, because I'd actually pulled out, was then at that point having decided to pull out. I was, of course, saying, well, God, they look desperately difficult. And I didn't dare say it to them because I didn't want to discourage them. And I'll never forget the night before they actually set out for that final push. And they were quite incredibly tensed. The route to the North Col proved treacherous and difficult. It took two attempts before Chris Bonington and Adrian Gordon reached the crest. Now it was a matter of watching and waiting. Hello, climbing team, you read, over. Regular calls on the radio produced no response from the ridge. But on the evening of May the 17th, they managed to pick out two tiny figures at the bottom of a V between two pinnacles before they disappeared from sight. It was the last time Pete Boardman and Joe Tasker were ever seen. Increasingly anxious, they scanned the ridge for any sign of movement. At one point they saw a patch of red high up on the ridge, only to realize it must have been the remains of a tent from some previous expedition. Utterly dejected, the two men returned to advanced base camp, where Charlie Clark was already waiting. Well, I think the the immediate, or there's the first reaction, which is, was, well, a long process of, of growing anxiety from when we last saw them on the night of the 17th through to the 21st, when we finally admitted to ourselves that something had desperately gone wrong and they are almost certainly dead. And that was just a period of sheer, grinding, desperate anxiety. And then, kind of through that period, you had ups and downs. You had moments when you thought, well, OK, it was going to be all right, when we saw a little um, red tent. When we talked about it, when you were on the North Col and I was at advance camp, 
I don't think there was ever any doubt in either of our minds that they'd had it, really. I mean, you, you can't live that long um, at those altitudes out of sight um, on, on a ridge like that. But it, 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 they are very curious, those emotions, when, when it happens, because I remember when we first met, we cried and, and uh, were very upset, and that was overtaken by a quite e enormous sense of um, plans and what we were going to do and, and uh, the urgency of potential rescues. And then, as, as you said before, you, you go through a, a, a mood of, of, I don't say it's, it's jovial in any way, but it's, it isn't misery at all. There seemed to be only two things that we could now do. One was to actually go up the ridge itself to try to see what had gone wrong. The problem here was that in the first instance, neither Adrian or Charlie were really experienced enough to cope with that kind of difficulty. I'm not at all sure that I could have even got back up to our high point. But on top of that, even if we had got up there, I think we'd have seen very, very little, because actually on the ridge, our vision would have been very, very restricted. On the other hand, if we managed to get round to the other side, to the Kanchung side of the mountain, we could see a lot more. And there was also what I realized was a forlorn hope that you still couldn't help holding on to it somehow, that perhaps if they had fallen, they'd somehow managed to descend the Kanchung face. So we felt that we just had to get round to the other side of the valley. It was a, a wonderful walk up the Cantrum Valley. It's a quite incredibly beautiful valley. And we were laughing and joking and, and getting on is just like a trek. And yet the, I think the, the, the feeling of loss, the worry, the anxiety, was always very close to the surface and, and something would suddenly bring this out. But at the same time, you, you also had a kind of, you know, you still had a sense of fun. You needed to have that to be able to survive it, to be able to actually do the things you had to do. And then the next morning, of course, in total contrast to this, was then the, the really grim moment when you gazed through the telescope and just gazed at that huge, terrifying face. And there was an immense sense of oppression. 